This is a short video to show how to um, use two uh, complementary methods. One is the imaginary uh, part of coherency for, um, for looking at functional connectivity using EEG. And another is an alternative uh, method for time frequency analysis that uses the Hilbert transform especially useful when you when you have a particular frequency band of interest to begin with. Okay, so let's look at the uh, imaginary part of coherency. Uh, I'm going to start with this, this raw data and I'm just going to uh, has some DC offsets, so I'm going to apply a uh, polynomial detrend filter. This polynomial detrend filter just gets rid of the very lowest Drift, uh, frequency drifts and offsets um, so that um, we haven't actually applied an FIR or an IIR filter. So this is a very gentle way to correct for uh, slow drifts throughout the recording. Okay, the other thing I've done here in this one, and I don't know what the reference was that was used. So I turned off this channel 65, um, which was set to pass through because we didn't have a location for it. So um, whatever the recording reference was is the one that I'll end up using. Um, we could, of course, apply a some other digital reference or a common average. Uh, but I won't be doing that. So uh, basically, I'm just going to show the steps of how to do this analysis. Okay, so um, I'll cancel out of that. So I'm going to start with analysis power spectrum. Now, the power spectrum, see a current coherence is above it. Power spectrum will also compute the coherence in some other measures. So um, uh, I'll show you how that works. So let's go to event locked. When I select event locked, we're going to use events and we'll select windows around those events. Uh, we'll use a power of two based on cubic spline interpolation. So I'll say next. And I'll select this DIN one. There are 100 events. and this is what, what I've been using. Um, I will look at the, the references that, that you sent me to see which parameters you actually want to use, but I've been using for uh, test purposes, I've been using minus 0.5 seconds to plus 0.5 seconds with the thought that there, um, uh, these are finger movements as I understand it and so there will be some pre-motor activity as well as post-motor and, and so that's why I chose this but uh, this is just for illustration purposes. Since I don't have an IIR filter in the pipeline I don't need to correct for any uh, warm-up artifacts. We've just put a polynomial detrend in there. So I'll just say interval of interest here. I'll say next. Uh, for this purpose, I won't reject anything. I'll just go here to the last page. Since this is not a, the events aren't stimuli, I'm not going to detrend. I'm not going to make a baseline. Um, use your own judgment. I'll also have to look at the papers that you want to replicate. And I'll say finish. Okay, so what's going on here? It's accumulating the cross spectral densities, which includes the auto spectral densities, which are essentially the power spectrum. So this is really calculating everything you need for power spectrum and coherence, and as it turns out, also the imaginary part of coherency. Um, so We'll let this finish. 
Um, I will say OK. And I'm going to select this one and, and overwrite the one that I did before. Okay, so so here it is, and we see our frequencies are going all uh, out, probably farther than we want. So I'm going to uh, stretch out the time scale, let's say to about here. So I'm seeing up to about 30 hertz, uh, superimposed. So this is the power spectrum. Um, and if, say, I want, so this looks like a... Uh, that's 8 hertz, so this is kind of a low alpha. Uh, but let's let's look at it. Let me load a scalp. And let's just look at that. Okay, so... Um, so that's what we're seeing. Uh, so some, some prefrontal alpha, probably due to uh, this relationship with the... This is event related, right? It's not it's not um, a resting state. So that's potentially interesting in its own right. It looks like there's another um, small peak out here. Don't know what that is. It's more widespread. Uh, looking at the contour over the map sometimes is more informative to see the patterns. Okay, so we've got frontal, prefrontal going on uh, related to this task. All right, but let's see what else we've got. Um, we also calculated, let's, let me go to the uh, chart recoder mode, and I will... Uh, let's, I'll... I'll if I right click here I can change the cross spectral type. So it's defaulted to power spectral density. There's cross spectral density which is like coherence but it's not normalized. Coherence is normalized like a like a um, correlation except it's like a complex correlation. The imaginary part looks at that complex part and, and let's look at that. But uh, also note that there's uh, the imaginary part is normalized uh, of coherency. The imaginary part of cross spectral density is not normalized. Well, let's select imaginary part of coherency. And now, since now, now this is pairwise, so now we'll want to select a coherence or a cross spectral reference channel. Let me right click there on 20. And set channel 20 to be the cross spectral reference. So that works for all of the types coherence, cross spectrum, imaginary part of coherency, and uh, 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 and the imaginary part of cross spectral. So um, notice our channel 20 went flat in this case. Um, let me go to superimposed mode and now um, a, a, a virtue of the imaginary part which I think I have, have the, the article you want to look at here this is a um, this is the first p paper that I'm aware of from 2004 to describe this measure by Guido Nolte et al uh, and Mark Hallett's group NIH. Um, this paper describes the the benefits of this. It basically, it's unlike coherence itself, um, where the maximum coherence is always going to be at the at the coherence reference, um, because every signal is perfectly coherent with itself. Um, unlike that case, we can see 
here that the, um, as we saw previously, the coherence reference, or the cross-spectral reference as we called it, is flat. In this case, it's zero. So the imaginary part is not sensitive to volume conduction, and that lets you see more distant um, regions that are still coherent, um, but after filtering out the volume conduction effect. Okay, so let's see here what we've got. Let's, uh, I've got a scalp. Scalp and sensors. Let's, um, let's look at it here. We've got contours. Those are pretty tight. Let's uh, let's make those a little less tight. Let's say 0 0.05 for our contour interval. Well, this is kind of interesting. So the um, here we're looking at, this turns out to be 5.99, so that's 6 hertz. We're looking at 6 hertz. Um, and at 6 hertz, whatever the functional interpretation is, this certainly looks like cerebellum, imaginary part of coherency. With respect to the, on the left side, with respect to on the left side, um, uh, motor at least if that's this is channel 20 okay but that's that's a relatively low frequency let's see what we've got if we look at for example here uh, this is 10 Hertz so let's see what's going on at 10 Hertz okay at 10 Hertz we're not seeing too much going on cerebellum. It looks like something more parietal. But let's look at let's look at some other frequencies. There we have um, 11 hertz, 10.98, 11 hertz. Now we're beginning to see something here, 11 hertz. Something maybe a little more interest here. More on the cerebellum on the right side. Still now. Uh, with with respect to the the left motor cortex, we can tighten that up a little bit. The contour lines, let's say, 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Now we can see in here um, some right cerebellum. Still see some hints of on the the left side, but it's stronger now on the right side at this frequency. So um, the you can play with this. Uh, there's another one. If we look at uh, 12 hertz, twelve hertz. Now we're seeing something on on both sides of cerebellum, apparently. So, um, just want to show you that as a possible method that you can experiment with. Okay, the other method I wanted to show you is another, so th this is power spectrum, it's not, um, uh, it doesn't take time into account, it's a frequency domain method. So let's Let's go back to the raw data and uh, let's leave that polynomial D trend filter in there. But now let's say now you are interested in, um, let's say, um, a frequency band. I think 8 to 14 hertz was mentioned. So let, let's take that one. Let's now add a digital IR filter and let's I'll notate uh, here 8 to 14 Hertz and I'll make it a band pass 
14, 8. 8 to 14 hertz. Start with this. Okay, this is the first step. So it'll be multiple steps. But now you can see um, you can see oscillations here in that frequency range of interest. Okay, so now what we can do to get a time frequency analysis using the Hilbert transform method. Alright, so the next thing I will do is I'll add another filter which is the um, it's it's under rectifier but under here um, I'm going to select all channels I'll use the Hilbert envelope okay, what, what's the Hilbert envelope it's basically going to um, what we have an oscillation like this it's going to make the the envelope around the oscillation so it's going to have a lower lower frequency but it's basically going to get the amplitude of the oscillations itself and I'm going to select log 10 output so we're going to take the Hilbert envelope this will end up being a non-negative um, result and then we're going to take the log of that and then as you'll see this will put things out of range but then we'll, we'll We'll bring them back in range in a second here. So let's say, okay, rectifier. Okay, this looks kind of strange. Um, but let's let's do another polynomial detrend filter here. So um, this time we're basically um, we're adjusting that log scale so that um, keeping in mind that log of 1 is 0 and 1 is the point is, is the balance point between um, increase or decrease so now now having removed uh, the the trend throughout the recording we can essentially say that something, so log of 1 is 0, um, so anything less than 1, well, after taking the log transform, will be a negative number. Anything greater than 1 will be a positive number, which means we can interpret these as relative increases or decreases in this band of interest. So let's see what happens. Now, in other words, at this point, I'm just going to treat it like we have an event-related potential. So let's, um, let's, now at this point, I'm going to do just ordinary averaging. But at this point, I now do have a, an IR filter in the pipeline, which can create edge effects. So I'm going to do this interval of interest plus 20% padding. Do next, next, next. Uh, once again, I'm not going to do any further detrending here. I don't know what you want to do, but it's uh, potentially problematic to say what a baseline is because before the movement, there's actually brain activity. So I won't, I won't uh, do baseline correction here. But now at this point, I'm averaging just like it's time domain activity. Uh, let's see here. Uh, here's one that I did before. I'm going to overwrite it. This is, I filtered at 8 to 14 hertz with the Hilbert transform. And let's overwrite it. Now there it is. So, um, Let's take a look at it and see what it looks like. Okay, so this is um, now keep in mind that this is time zero is the time when the uh, the movement took place. So now we have 
time information again. So this is a kind of time frequency approach. But everything we're looking at is confined to the frequency range of from 8 to 14 hertz. So at and so we can map this. And we can also interpret this as something uh, greater than zero means that those oscillations, the, the oscillations in the 8 to 14 hertz range, the, the envelope, the Hilbert envelope was larger, whereas um, afterwards, so we could call that a synchronization, whereas afterwards we could look at the, if it's smaller than zero, we could think of that as a desynchronization. Okay, but let's just look at time zero and see what that is. Uh, oh, well, that's interesting. Um, potentially of interest. Oh, that's on the sensor. Let's just, let's do the contour. Well, that's interesting. It looks like we do have something going on here. Cerebellum. Um, looks like it might be biased a bit towards the right side. Now keep in mind, this is not coherence anymore. This is, um, this is a kind of time frequency analysis, but it's based on the predefined frequency band. Okay, so now we can look at it in time. Um, I don't know if this is, but there's a seems to be a desynchronization on some particular channel here. A few milliseconds now. So now we are uh, about 30 milliseconds following the movement. Let's see what that is. We want to look at the back side. Looks like something. Cerebellum also involved. Looks like there's left something on the left frontal side there. Um, I can't really say whether this would be ocular. This is, appears to be in the eyes, but it's obviously interpolated from some channel. So we, we'd better get straight on what these other channels are. Um, I'm not sure what some of the other channels were. Um, let's let's look again. So here's uh, seems to be preceding the movement at about 160 milliseconds before the movement. Let's see what that looks like. And preceding the movement here we have a distribution before the movement. 160 milliseconds and it's interesting we're seeing something more on the right side. This of course could as a synchronization sometimes is interpreted as a kind of um, suppression. So it could be it could be on the uh, the ipsilateral side to the movement that there's some suppression going on in this frequency band. Of course, this is a broad frequency band from 8 to 14. And we saw from the, the imaginary coherency results that there seems to be a distinction of subbands in there. 